They are the world's most dangerous weapons. Their blast can destroy a city. Their fireballs burn hotter than the sun. Today, defiant nations desperately pursue them. At home, agencies prepare for the worst. What would you do if you learned that terrorists were trying to get a nuclear weapon? Or even to make their own? Would you know how to stop them? Now, learn the science behind the headlines. The intelligence world leaders need to know. In the briefing that takes you inside the nuclear threat. just become the leader of your nation. The fate of millions now rests in your hands. But what if new intelligence soon confirmed the worst? Terrorists are trying to make a nuclear weapon and detonated in one of your cities. Could they really get the materials? or master the engineering. How powerful would the bomb be? And what can you do to stop them? To make your decisions, you need to know more about nuclear weapons, how they work, their effects on a city, what you shouldn't be scared of, and what you should. You'll find it all in this nuclear briefing. blast wave can travel a thousand feet in a second. Their fireballs burn at over 9,000 degrees. The explosion of even a makeshift nuclear device could decimate one of your cities. Five city blocks would be vaporized by the massive explosion. A mile away, buildings damaged beyond repair. Winds could carry radioactive fallout for a hundred miles or more. Survivors would have to stay sheltered for weeks or risk death or illness from exposure. Some places could remain contaminated for months or even years. Yet this terrifying power is contained in something almost inconceivably small, the atom itself. Anyone trying to build a bomb must master its laws. To stop them, so do you. Or you may make a fatal decision. Fortunately, you have help. An intelligence briefing led by physicist Richard Muller. Deep inside this atom is a tiny little thing called the nucleus. In this nucleus, you have all of the positive charge. Now, positive charge repels other positive charge, and so they're trying to fly apart. 
It's like a compressed spring, but it's held together by a latch we call the nuclear force. If that nuclear force is broken, then the two pieces lose that and they go flying apart. This is nuclear fission, the key to the bomb's explosive force. It's this flying off that releases this enormous energy it's a million times more than when an atom of TNT explodes. Remnants of the atom, the radiation, race out near the speed of light. When they fly off, they crash into other atoms. Typically, they just make the other atoms move too. This kind of motion is what we call heat. The heat is so intense, hotter than the surface of the sun, that it blasts outward at the speed of sound. This thing is now so hot that it just expands with enormous disruption. That's what an atomic bomb is. Your intelligence sources identify those seeking these weapons. The most obvious case, North Korea. But does this rogue state really have the capacity to build a bomb? It's almost impossible to get information from what is perhaps the most closed society on Earth. If you want to know more, you need your own sources. High above North Korea, satellites watch for secrets below. One location is of great interest. What we're looking at in this photo here is it's a relatively new facility. It might look like a uh, regular mining activity, except that there's not a lot of mineral extraction going on. And there's not a lot of tailings. If it had been used for mining, we would have detected that a long time ago. The remote site appears to have another purpose, one which experts can see simply by going online. Well, a three-dimensional view shows tunneling activity at the base of this mountain here. And if you zoom all the way in, you can basically see the support camp and then uh, access road that leads to the horizontal tunnel entrance. It is an ideal location for an underground nuclear test. You're using the strength of the mountain to prevent the gases from the uh, nuclear explosion from venting. And they also seal the tunnel entrance up with uh, concrete as well. In 2006, and again in 2009, the North Koreans claimed they were testing atomic weapons. But the images taken after each alleged explosion show no visible change to the surface. Nothing that reveals if a bomb was actually detonated. If you're trying to detect a nuclear explosion done by a foreign country, secretly, a spy satellite won't do the job. It turns out by far the most effective is to look at the artificial earthquake that such an explosion creates. Teams at Livermore Labs in California have been working to do just that. In theory, finding the evidence is easy. Imagine a stone dropping into a pond. You can think of a seismic event in, in the same way in the Earth. Uh, the waves pass down through the Earth, and then they come up to a recording station in, in, in the distance. If you imagine stations all around the Earth then, then you get the basis for starting to be able to locate that event and eventually identify it. But the task isn't so simple. The Earth is constantly shaking. We have to find the explosions against a background seismicity worldwide of several hundred thousand events a year. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, mine collapses, uh, civil explosions. There's a whole series of seismic events that seismologists look at. The key to identifying an explosion lies in the way it rattles the rock around it. Every earthquake sends out two kinds of waves, a pressure, or P wave, 
moves the rock forward or backward. A shear, or S-wave, moves it up and down or side to side. Nuclear bombs shape the Earth differently than natural events. There's a fundamental difference between uh, the earthquake and explosion sources. If you look at the earthquake source, they're a result of block motion. Block motion of the Earth moves this way like that, okay? And that creates primarily shear wave energy in the Earth. So an explosion source, when it goes off, it, it explodes out in all directions evenly and pushes on the Earth evenly in all directions. So the explosion source primarily creates these P waves. Any event that emits strong pressure but weak shear waves is likely an explosion. In the North Korean case here, uh, the uh, recent test was indeed an explosion. Seismology can't tell you if it was nuclear or not, but we can estimate the yield. The North Korean blasts created small artificial earthquakes, just over four on the Richter scale. This suggests the size of the explosion. A one kiloton explosion uh, is about a magnitude four. One kiloton, the equivalent of a thousand tons of TNT, large enough to support North Korea's claim of a nuclear weapon. It could destroy Times Square and all the buildings that surround it. Half a mile away, exposed skin burns. At three miles, the flash could cause blindness. Horrific as it would be, however, a one kiloton explosion is small for a nuclear weapon. To put that in perspective, think of the energy released when the two airplanes went into the World Trade Center. The energy released by those two airplanes was about 1.8 kilotons of TNT. So in fact, the North Korean nukes, each of those, was less than the energy released in the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. North Korea's nukes created huge explosions, but nowhere near the scale of even the first nuclear weapons. The first North Korean nuke was uh, 400 tons of TNT, 0.4 kilotons. Compare that to the first American test at Almogordo, which was 20,000 tons. That's 0.4 to 20. The 1945 U.S. test was 50 times larger. If dropped on a major city, as one was on Nagasaki, it would destroy everything within 4,000 feet. Flying debris would kill people far beyond that. Modern warheads can be over 1,000 times as powerful. They can destroy buildings 10 miles away from the blast. But the North Korean explosion had a destructive radius of just 450 feet. Radiation could still harm many beyond this range. But the blast is remarkably small for a nuclear weapon. Experts think something went wrong with the Korean nukes. Yes, something that diminished their power. The key could be in the bomb's design. The basic design of a nuclear bomb is you take a small particle called a neutron and send it into a piece of uranium or plutonium and it triggers that explosion. When the fission occurs, more neutrons come flying out. Uh, typically two, maybe three. When the bomb works, this creates a chain reaction. You set off one nucleus, and then the neutrons that come out, if they happen to hit another nucleus, will create additional explosions. Each explosion releases still more neutrons, 
creating twice as many new explosions. They then trigger twice their number, and this goes on and on. Every time you have one more generation, one more level, you're doubling the energy that's coming out. Pretty soon, you could have exploded every nucleus. And then you're releasing a million times more energy than if that uranium were made out of TNT or dynamite. But physicists believe the chain reaction in the North Korean bomb stopped when it blew itself apart. What went wrong depends on the type of nuke they were making. There are two basic kinds of fission bombs, uranium or plutonium. Each has its own advantages. For most countries, the plutonium bomb is easier to get the material. Plutonium is manufactured in a nuclear reactor. Anybody who has a nuclear reactor is basically making plutonium. This makes plutonium a natural choice for the North Koreans. Reports show they have operated nuclear reactors for decades. Getting hold of the plutonium is relatively easy, but making this kind of bomb is not. The design has been publicly known for years. You take a shell of plutonium, you surround it, with explosives, explosives that have lenses in them so they'll focus all of the energy inward and you get an implosion. That's not easy to do. It's like squeezing a water balloon. You try squeezing a water balloon, it tends to pop out between your fingers. Uh, to do it, you have to squeeze it with a exquisitely uniform, inward-going explosion. The slightest imperfection will reduce the bomb's explosive power. But a bomb made of uranium doesn't need to be so complex. And that's the danger. For uranium, it takes two pieces of uranium-235, each one less than a critical mass. You put one inside of a gun or a cannon, and you shoot it at the other one very rapidly. So when they come together, you get more than a critical mass. When the first plutonium bomb was made, no one was sure if it would work. So it was tested at Alamogordo. But no test was made for the uranium bomb. It didn't need one. The first uranium device ever exploded was at Hiroshima. The simplicity of its design makes uranium more likely to be the bomb that terrorists will try to make. And that you, as leader of your nation, have to worry about. If a group of terrorists got a hold of purified uranium, they could probably make an atom bomb. The hard part is getting the uranium. Uranium is a natural element mined from metallic ores in the Earth. In its raw state, less than 1% of the explosive kind needed to make a bomb. Uranium-235. The rest is uranium-238. To make this chain reaction go in a bomb, you have to get rid of that uranium-238. It's a, it's a pollutant that stops the chain reaction from going. The trick is to purify or enrich the uranium to create higher concentrations of the volatile 235. For bombs, it's enriched to 90%. The modern way to enrich uranium is to take that uranium, turn it into a gas, and then send it to a centrifuge. The centrifuge is typically a pipe, a long, tall pipe. The gas is put inside, and then it spins at an extremely high rate. Inside, the heavier uranium-238 is spun to the outside, leaving the lighter uranium-235 in the middle of the cylinder. And then the gas is basically sucked off at the top with a soda straw, the lighter uranium coming from the center.
To find out if terrorists can make uranium this way, you consider another nuclear program. Iran's. Iran insists its atomic program is peaceful. But recent satellite imagery has revealed the construction of secret nuclear facilities there. Well, what we have here is a satellite view of a uranium enrichment facility in Iran. There's nothing in the actual layout of the, of the above ground physical structure that indicates it's a, a uranium enrichment facility. It was only because of uh, a tip-off from uh, human intelligence that we know that that's what this purpose is. Initial reports suggest that six buildings here provide space for centrifuges to operate. The critical question is how much bomb-grade uranium such facilities could make. But there are limits to what even the best satellites can tell a future president. They take a really good camera, like the Hubble Space Telescope, and if you put that in a low orbit, it's amazing what you can see. Your resolution is about between two and three inches. 200 miles up, you still can't read a license plate. But you could estimate an object's height by its shadow. But there's a catch. Um, if the satellite is going to stay in orbit, it has to be moving at 17,000 miles per hour. That means it's not going to hang around very long. At that speed, the satellite will pass overhead in just 80 seconds, and only once a day. Even with these limitations, satellites can reveal critical information. Earlier GOI images of the site in Iran expose something startling. You can see that basically they're building these large underground cascade buildings here. And in this image, they're layering concrete upon dirt upon concrete to create a multi-layer defense against any kind of earth-penetrating uh, weapon. The secret complex is protected and camouflaged. After they were finished with it, they filled in the dirt outside of the perimeter. And so when they finished, it looks as though this is the complete facility. In fact, the real facility is outside the perimeter in this area over here. The hidden buildings are massive, each one larger than five football fields. The square footage at Natanz would certainly support enough centrifuges to enrich uranium to uh, the, the level that you would need for a weapons program. Most analysts believe Iran has not yet enriched uranium to the level required for a weapon. But they think this vast infrastructure could do it. Enriching the uranium for a nuclear reactor and enriching it for a bomb are basically the same process. Those same centrifuges can enrich it to 80, 90, close to 100%. You keep on running it through and it gets more and more enriched. The process is exactly the same. And the design of the bomb is the easy part. For a simple uranium bomb, you, or a terrorist, would need about 60 pounds of highly enriched uranium. It can take a year for 3,000 centrifuges working in concert to produce enough material for a single weapon. Nations are the only powers with the means to operate so many of these machines. The technology required to enrich uranium is very precise is very difficult to find and would take a long time to master. So for a terrorist group to enrich its own uranium would be very, very unlikely. Terrorists may not be able to make the uranium themselves, but they need it to build a weapon. To protect your people, you need to know the other ways they can get the deadly material. And a bomb. Terrorists don't need a nuclear program to get their hands on weapons-grade material. 
Some nations have already enriched the uranium. All they have to do is get it. There is enough nuclear material in Russia alone to make some 60,000 bombs. Nearly half of it is stored at sites with poor security and tracking systems. 40 other nations also hold weapons-grade material. Some at research facilities. Many of these stockpiles are vulnerable to black market sales or theft. Your first line of defense, work to improve security at these sites. Still, it's possible that terrorists could simply steal the material to make a bomb, or buy it from someone who had. To guard your people, you need reports on the defenses you and your allies can deploy to counter this threat. Just two years ago, suspects were arrested here in Slovakia, carrying over a pound of highly enriched uranium into the European Union. Experts believe it almost certainly came from a former Soviet Republic. Now, officials use special equipment to scan vehicles at surprise checkpoints, like this one, to intercept any such shipments. Atoms in radioactive material are prone to split spontaneously. When they do, they can emit high-energy particles, or gamma rays, that set off an alarm in special detectors. We have an alarm now, maybe some uh, smuggling materials. We don't know exactly now, but we need to make the detailed secondary inspection. Many materials can trigger the alarm because there are many naturally occurring sources of radiation. Okay, okay. Detailed inspections can tell materials that are dangerous from those that aren't. Today's alarm is like most, benign. For example, we had a cases that we found some mushrooms. We had a cases we found some uh, concrete. We had a cases we found the people which were treated by radiological sources in the hospital. To intercept nuclear threats in transit, you and your allies must distinguish between bomb-making material and these legitimate radioactive sources. Worldwide, the scale of the challenge is daunting. Over a hundred million cargo containers move through the world's ports each year. More than eight million come through Antwerp, Belgium. A few ounces of highly enriched uranium may be hidden among a hundred million tons of cargo. But there are assets you can deploy to help even the odds like the detectors recently installed by Belgian and U.S. authorities throughout the port. Officers analyze data from containers that set off radiological alarms. A single alarm could uncover a plot. This container has alarmed one of the portals at the container terminal. So we asked them to come over here so that we could scan the container.
we're going to take a radiological picture and we'll take a picture with an x-ray scan. So we'll look at the inside of the container just as if you're going to the hospital and take an x-ray of our lungs. Different sources create different kinds of radiation. Each has a telltale signature. So what we see here is the energy distribution of the gamma radiation coming from this truck. This image tells me that there's only naturally occurring radioactive materials present in the truck. The X-ray exposes a common natural source of radiation, stone. The cargo is then released. Today, most maritime containers entering countries like the United States are screened. Efforts like these may persuade terrorists not to move bomb-grade materials through these channels. But there are already large quantities of uranium and plutonium within your borders. What you need to know now is just how vulnerable they are to being used against your own people. There are more than 400 nuclear power plants in the world. A quarter are in the United States alone. Most run on uranium. All of them produce plutonium. Some believe they could be tempting targets for terrorists or be made to explode like bombs. But are these risks real? And could you defend against them if they were? At most nuclear plants, security begins far from the reactor. We have multiple barriers at the property perimeters. We have closed circuit television cameras, barrier fences. Further measures guard the plant itself. But even if these defenses were breached, the radioactive materials remain protected. Inside of that containment structure is where our reactor is housed. Reactors use the incredible heat of nuclear fission to make steam. This drives massive turbines that create electricity. In the West, the radioactive core is surrounded by eight inch steel and concrete shielding three to seven feet thick. That sits inside a containment structure. Two inches of steel and three to four feet of reinforced concrete. That is designed to withstand tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. From a robustness and, a, and from an engineering design, it's extraordinarily strong. It is so massive, it can withstand the impact of a crashing jumbo jet like those used in the September 11th attacks. The airplanes have to be light, so they make it strong, but they make it strong like an eggshell is strong. It's thin and strong. But if you take an eggshell and smash it against the plate, or if you take a big airplane and smash it against feet of concrete, it's mostly the airplane that's going to be damaged, not the containment vessel. But suppose terrorists did get inside, or somehow sabotaged the plant. Could they turn a nuclear reactor into a nuclear bomb? The key lies in the chain reaction. In a bomb, a single fission can trigger a chain reaction that will explode billions of billions of other atoms. But in a reactor, the number of splitting atoms stays constant. A sustained reaction. To maintain a sustained chain reaction, one neutron, exactly one neutron from every fission, makes it back and causes another fission, and that's a sustained chain reaction. 
This means less of the fissile material is required. So reactor grade uranium is enriched to only about 3% instead of the 90% that's in a bomb. It simply cannot blow up like a nuclear weapon. So a nuclear power plant can't blow up like an atomic bomb. That's not possible. The physics doesn't allow it. But there is still a danger. If the chain reaction got out of hand and began splitting more atoms, it could create enough heat to cause a small explosion in the reactor. This happened at Chernobyl in 1986. Radioactive materials were released into the atmosphere. Our bodies typically handle about 400 bombardments every minute from naturally occurring radiation. The danger comes when the radioactivity gets intense so that your body can't really keep up. At Chernobyl, 30 workers and firefighters died. Most from intense short-term radiation. But the greatest public health risk was the plume of radioactive smoke that escaped and spread across Europe. But Chernobyl's design made this outcome more likely. The Chernobyl reactor did not have a containment structure. It is likely that if Chernobyl had a containment structure, that event would have released very little, if any, radiation. All reactors in the United States and many other countries are required to have such containment. The intelligence suggests that nuclear reactors in your country may not be effective targets. But this doesn't mean terror groups have given up on a nuclear attack. What you need to know now is if there are other ways for them to achieve their goals. Intelligence suggests that terrorists may try to get a functioning thermonuclear weapon, also known as hydrogen or H-bombs. The two-stage systems use a uranium or plutonium device just as their trigger. This ignites a payload of hydrogen at such high temperatures that the atoms fuse together, releasing tremendous energy. It's the same process, fusion, that powers the sun. A single H-bomb dwarfs the size of any fission device. The largest ever detonated was the equivalent of 58 million tons of TNT, some 3,000 times the size of the Nagasaki blast. Most of the warheads in the Russian and American arsenals are H-bombs. They're mounted on ballistic missiles that can carry their nuclear payload across the globe in mere minutes. Once launched, they are virtually unstoppable. As the Cold War arsenals of the US and Russia are reduced, some analysts fear these superweapons may fall into the wrong hands. Integrated self-destruct systems are designed to keep them secure. We have capabilities in our arsenal. Uh, for example, if a terrorist were tampering with them, the weapon would sense that and would disable itself. I would believe that the Russians have similar types of technologies. And the means to actually build these complex weapons is well beyond most nations, much less terrorist groups. I would say the probability is close to zero that they could ever build a thermonuclear device. 
But terrorists have a much more attainable option. The dirty bomb. This crude weapon is easy to build and requires only a small amount of radioactive material. Nuclear waste or other radioactive material is wrapped in conventional explosives. When these detonate, they spread the radioactivity across a populated area. All the bomb needs is someone to set it off. The ideal target, a stadium, a large gathering, a national icon. But the greatest physical danger of a dirty bomb doesn't come from its radioactivity. You're, you're probably more likely to get killed from the high explosive as you are from the radioactive materials that are dispersed. The real aim of a dirty bomb may be to incite panic and dread. To be lethal, radioactivity must be intensely concentrated. At low levels, it isn't even dangerous. Dirty bombs are designed to spread out the radiation to try and contaminate more people. But this lessens the effect of the radiation on any one person. Once dispersed, the radioactivity may not be intense enough to cause any ill effects. So this is the irony. If the terrorist is trying to kill more people by spreading out the radioactivity, he winds up killing fewer people because you get below this threshold at which it's not a poison at all. There is, however, one final possibility that could threaten the lives of millions. Worldwide, nuclear materials have been stolen or lost over 400 times in the past 15 years. The amounts are usually small, rarely over a pound, and few are highly enriched. Still, 65% of known losses have not been recovered. If terrorists got 60 pounds of highly enriched uranium, an enormous amount, they could possibly make an improvised nuclear device. It would be a gun-style bomb designed to collide two masses of uranium together. It could fit in a small boat, airplane, or car and could enter your nation at a remote part of your border. The explosion of such a weapon could equal the size of Hiroshima. The consequences for any city, anywhere, would be devastating. The bomb vaporizes everything in an area a mile across. Buildings for a half mile beyond are damaged beyond repair. Radioactive fallout blankets the city. Infrastructure is wiped out. In a densely populated city, the death toll could reach a million. Even with bomb-grade uranium in hand, however, the terrorists' task would not be simple. The engineering of even a crude nuclear design 
I think it will stress most types of terrorist capabilities. If you had a team of physicists and engineers and ballistics experts, then maybe you can do it, but it's not an easy thing to do. This may give some comfort. But so long as nuclear weapons exist, and the materials to make them remain at risk. Nuclear threats will continue to be a haunting possibility, both for you and your people.